I wanted to thank um, Dr. Chapman, Jack, Dr. Ziegler, and Dr. Blumenthal for inviting me to speak at this meeting. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, You're all a tough act to follow because I come from an environment where I'm an engineer, and we spend our time in the minutia um, and trying to figure out what can go wrong. Mine is more in that preclinical stage when we're starting to look at design. So what I want to do here is Hopefully, there we go. Kind of give a, a real brief overview of what I'm going to call form follows function um, and TDR design, mainly because I want us to, to think about at the end of this talk, are we over engineering, especially after seeing the clinical data for both cervical and lumbar? Are we, we could very well be over engineering. And can we get there if we continue to over engineer? Uh, the smaller nuances of improving upon what already exists. <clears throat> so I go back to the form follows function from yesterday, and I want to kind of give you just a brief overview of the anatomy and the mechanics of it. So you start to think about, geez, we are designed when we're born as perfect animals with respect to form and function. Our spines, as you all know, move in multiple planes and translate, rotate and translate with what we call six degrees of freedom, which means you're moving um, your spine about three orthogonal axes freely. <clears throat> and it's determined by the nature of the surface um, articulation, the bearing surface articulation. So yesterday we talked about the facet joint, perfect uh, example of form versus function. They're cup-shaped, they have a small gap pressure, and if you start to distract that, you disrupt, you disrupt that form which can disrupt its function. <clears throat> I love using these sections from Dr. Rauschning from years ago because they're just, to me, they're beautiful to look at when you think about our anatomy. These are sections, cryo sections taken through the cervical and lumbar spine. I'll probably use a lot of cervical arthroplasty examples for this talk, but when we think about our curvature, it's how we walk erect, that the actual curvature of our cervical thoracic lumbar sacral um, allows us to be bipedal. The disc is really elliptically shaped. It's a composite viscoelastic material from the engineering standpoint, and it's strain rate dependent. You load it fast, it behaves differently than if you load it slow, and I always use that silly putty analogy. If you pull it fast, silly putty, it snaps. If you pull it slow, you get greater displacement. Um, and one, um, our bone is anisotropic. It's not uniformly distributed. In animals, it tends to be more uniformly distributed and much more dense. But in humans, it doesn't work that way. And there's great variability as we age um, between our discs and our bone. We start to lose bone mass. We start to lose hydration in our disc. I used to be, I used to be five ten. But unfortunately, <laughs> I must be pretty dried out. Um, and finally, from a biomechanical standpoint, the cervical spine and the mechanics of it is very different from the lumbar. But a lot of that is related to the form. Our facets are more coronally placed in the cervical uh, spine versus the lumbar, et cetera. The, the loads are larger in the lumbar. So we talk about our facets and our disc. They work in conjunction, but if the disc starts to generate, degenerate, which will occur uh, first, then the facets are gonna respond because they have to take up the rest of the load. The rest of the stress is being transferred. It has to go somewhere. If the disc cannot absorb that stress efficiently, it gets transferred to the posterior elements, and then you start to see issues such as hypertrophy of the facet or um, uh, bone remodeling, osteophytes, et cetera, on the uh, margins of the vertebral bodies. So when they do work together in an interdependent manner, they can respond synergistically. Finally, we talk about load balance and having that healthy load transmission through the spine. Yes, quality of motion is important when you think about the kinematic signatures that Dr. Phillips was showing us yesterday, but so is maintaining that load balance balance as we degenerate, as our discs dry out. We change that balance of how that load is being distributed through the spine. And um, so normally, you know, our vertebra and disc will take up about 55 to 60 percent of that load will be borne by that anterior column set. The cortical shell plays a role. It's thin, but it can actually absorb up to 10 percent. And our ligaments, 
um, also will shield that force or share that load with the um, uh, disc and anterior column as, as well as the posterior column. The facets usually see about 20 to 25 percent of that load, but if you disrupt that synergy, that relationship, that just starts to degenerate, that can increase up to 40 to 50%. So now you're asking the facets to do more than what they're designed to do. And then things start to break down. So we spend our lifetime trying to fix that, trying to bring it back to where it was. We talk about the center of rotation. So I'm gonna leave with these two concepts because it's going to be important with respect to thinking about arthroplasty for both the cervical and lumbar spine. When we as engineers look at the center rotation, it is one plane of motion where we can look at flexion extension, lateral bending, doc, um, axial rotation. Dr. Pat Warden's done an incredible job being able to map this out kinematically. And you look at that and where that center of rotation ends up. And in natural tissue, native tissue, you're looking at flexion extension. It's not in the middle of the disc, as you can see. It's actually halfway almost between the tip of the spinous process and the anterior margin of the vertebral body and really lies um, in this inferior ver vertebral body as shown. And of course, it's different in the lateral plane, bending plane, and different in the rotational plane. When we think about it three-dimensionally, we talk about this neutral axis. What's the neutral axis? Well, it's kind of a fancy word for the center of rotation, but it's an imaginary three-dimensional column <clears throat> or spherical column that really kind of aligns itself not only with the curvature of the spine, but um, again, at that halfway point between the tip of the process and the anterior margin of the bone, as you can see. And so the red arrows are just the force vectors of, um, uh, for each level uh, in the X and uh, Z and X plane as shown. Why is this important? It's important when you think about alignment issues, when you're thinking about not only putting in fusions and plates and posterior fixation, because you can shift that center of rotation just through fixation, um, either anterior or posterior, which can be detrimental to the spine, um, but you try to balance that. And you can also shift and disrupt it if, it's, uh, if you're misaligning a total disc, for instance. Um, so trying to align along that axis, uh, even if it's single or multiple levels of arthroplasty devices, is going to be crucial so that you don't disrupt the load balance and you don't disrupt the quality of motion. So we'll kind of look at how do these factors really affect TDR performance and longevity. Now, Initially, I'm kind of putting it in one bucket with respect to overall, when you think about just the arthroplasty, not the design per se, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. There's a lot of things that can go right, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And we know as the goal, the goal clinically is very different from the goal biomechanically. Clinically, we want to provide pain relief, increase patient activity, and reduce the risk of postoperative fusion problems such as adjacent segment disease, which is adverse stress transfer from the biomechanical engineering side to the other levels that can cause augmented degeneration. You want to make sure that you don't avoid bone graft donor site pain and um, make sure that you minimize risk to pseudoarthrosis. But from a biomechanical standpoint, we want to maintain segmental spinal motion. Now, that's an important point because it does come down to the patient. You know, it's tough to say you're gonna take a 75-year-old patient, 75-year-old woman, and say, all right, I'm gonna make your disc like it was 25. Tissue adapts. It adapts for a reason, good and bad. So you have to think about that too. Um, we wanna restore the normal biomechanical function um, over the disease, to, to that disease segment um, and restore it normal for that patient and restore the disc height and lordosis. There's different classifications for TDRs. And this is where I come in and I start to ask the questions on this. So constrained is considered, there's multiple um, definitions, but it's a mode of motion that includes one mechanical stop in the design of the TDR within the normal physiological range of motion. So that mechanical stop is gonna stop within what we would call a non-destructive or normal range of motion in, a, in all three planes. We want to limit on the number of the degrees of, this limits the, the degrees of freedom um, with respect to the motion in this three-dimensional space, and we'll get into that a little bit. The semi-constrained 
is a mode of motion that includes a mechanical stop outside the normal physiological range of motion. What does that mean? It allows that device to move much more freely in that range of motion because the stop of where it's set is outside of that natural native range of motion for the human desk. And unconstrained is a mode of motion that includes no mechanical stop whatsoever. Not sure if that's really, um, it's a very generic definition, let's just put it that way, because I'm not sure how accurate that is, um, because it really depends on material stiffness and, and part of the design. But they call talk about this zero constraint, meaning it has six degrees of freedom. We talked about the motions being in shear, which is translation in AP plane and medial lateral, as well as rotation, um, lateral bending, and flexion extension. But the additional degree of freedom here that the uh, ball and sockets or the constraints and constraints lack is the compression and tension. But I'm going to question that because some of the elastomeric discs, some of which um, are not in their IDE studies, can be very, very stiff. So how much compression and tension are you really seeing? <clears throat> It's been classified even further, and uh, Dr. Pat Warden and Dr. Havia have published this wonderful paper from an engineering perspective of breaking down these designs. I'm using cervical because they're much more um, uh, available uh, and prevalent in the literature with respect to design work. But we have three component TDRs and we have two component TDRs. The three components have two articulating bearing joints as shown. They have the incompressible biconvex core, meaning you're not going to get that compression tension. That's the missing degree of freedom. Then we have two component TDRs where you can have very different degrees of freedom, freedom based on the design, but it's two pieces as shown. It's of that ball and socket, maybe a saddle type nature in the cervical. It still also has that incompressible biconvex for core, again, limiting compression tension. Now, again, some of these devices, especially the earlier designs, lacked the ability to translate as well. And then we have the non-articulating, what I'm calling elastomeric, but they're compressible, that has the six degrees of freedom and adds that extra motion. Again, I question it because it's really dependent upon the stiffness and the design in that aspect. They offer often com compliant cores and there's this inherent stiffness that will affect the stability and ability to restore that physiological motion. Um, I use, you know, there's four examples here, Brian disc, which obviously is not on the market um, currently, M6 disc, um, the Rhine and the CPESP disc, of which I'm less familiar with. So we're faced with a lot of challenges just from the design aspect of it. Can we really achieve near physiological motion and mimic those in vivo biomechanics? And now I'm going to add, how much does it really matter? There's a lot of wiggle room in humans. And I said this one time, and I had um, a group of hardcore design engineers that were in aerospace now working and designing medical devices, jumped on my throat, go, no, we can get it very, very precise. But we as humans are not precise. We differ so much, there's so much variability, but we also have a lot of slack in our tissue. It's, it can be quite forgiving, and Dr. Pat Warden has done some studies where we're seeing two to four millimeters of what I'm calling wiggle room. If we're off by that amount, it doesn't really matter. It's when you start to breach the, the edges where you're going to see issues. Um, but we do have to think about that quality of motion. Dr. Phillips presented a beautiful example last night where, you know, with ball and sockets, um, with some of the designs, you'll get a rapid increase, a rapid stiffness, and then it flexes over. And that, too, isn't qu uh, the best quality of motion because our bodies don't like repetitive <coughs> impact uh, situations because it will result in earlier failure. And we know that, we know that it's true for every tissue in our body. We see it in brain, uh, concussion work, uh, sub-threshold loads, but many sub-threshold loads with rapid increases, um, rapid strains can result in detri detrimental failures with respect to the tissue, and it's true in spine as well. There's an inherent stiffness with a lot of these designs. Uh, there's different degrees of freedom. 
and their surgical considerations. But I wanted to, to leave with that tissue adaptation. The, the best news this morning is looking at this five, seven, 10 year data, knowing that in 10 years we are older, we are different, our tissue has adapted differently and tissue will adapt in a positive manner or a negative manner. We all know about Wolf's Law. It exists for every tissue in our body. So if you start to change that loading paradigm um, and that cyclic paradigm <coughs> and that motion paradigm, your tissue is going to adapt to compensate for that. But with what we're seeing 10 years out, where it's better satisfaction for both lumbar and cervical, less revision surgeries, maybe that adaptation will take a lot longer um, to see because we stiffen as we age. Um, we, we become more degenerative as we age, unfortunately. <coughs> and again, there's material limitations to what we have currently. Do we really have to do better? So um, I'm going to do just some generic uh, comparisons between ball and socket and elastomeric. And again, this is where I spend the bulk of my work thinking about what if, what can go wrong? Why? Because I'm the one that needs to address those preclinical pre potential risks with the clients and the FDA to say this is potentially what could go wrong. And so we looked at it, and it could be very design specific. We know that misalignment um, along that center of rotation or the full neutral axis can be detrimental because not only does it disrupt your load balance, but it also changes your stresses to the other levels as well. Um, regardless of if it's a fusion or a TDR, if you've got multiple levels of TDR and you're, you've got one or two that may not be along that neutral axis, now you're loading your spine differently. You're forcing your body, you're forcing your tissue to compensate for that change in load. Now, it can also change the stress pattern to the posterior elements. So again, misalignment may result in overloading of your facets. The beauty about our tissue is that we often get radiographic markers that will be some sort of indication that something's going wrong. Uh, for instance, if you're overloading your facets because of placement potentially or because of potential micromotion, you're going to see lucencies from micromotion. But with overloading, you might see uh, changes in the facet joint, denser bone where that bone has to compensate for the added load, the change in load. You may see that in your CTs, you may see that in your MRIs, and you may see that in your x-rays. And that's the clues, the evidence that you need to say, all right, there's something not right, there's some sort of balance or eccentric loading indication here because I'm seeing um, greater bone osteophytes, perfect indicator of there's a change in that load pattern. Why do we have osteophytes? What's going on? Well, we're making the bone do more work. We're making it absorb more load. So it's going to respond. I thought this was interesting, looking at the different cervical discs. I've got the Brian is in here as well. And of course, you know, PCM, other um, cervicals. But just look at the design-based center of rotation. That's, that's the one column I focused on here. When you think about that center of rotation that I showed you in that early slide, look how different it is for all these different designs. You know, Brian says, okay, that center of rotation is centered, uh, I, I believe, in the disc area. But as you go to the ball and socket designs, they're, they're quite different. One is more in the inferior vertebral body, one is more in the superior vertebral body. And these are the nuances where, you know, not all discs are the same in their design, but does it matter? Um, and I put this as a pitfalls and design considerations to think about. So we know that you can change with the ball and socket designs. You can change the design of the ball part or even the, the end plate part with the amount of translation with how that ball moves within the plate. Um, but you can, by changing its surface, maybe the angular surface, maybe the finish, maybe the material, maybe the curvature, um, adding or not having translation, you change the mechanics. You can have mismatched range of motion. So if you don't have that translation, translation in a ball and socket is 
to me, energy dissipation. You're dissipating the load and the stress away from all of it being transferred to the next level. So it allows you to um, have better mechanics that way where you're not having an increase in stress transferred to the next level. Again, the brain works the same way. We made helmets to slide because we need time. We need to decrease the impact stimulus to the brain and we need to dissipate a lot of that force away from the brain. And there's a lot of work that goes into that because if that brain has to take all of that force, not only are you having strict coup contra coup, but you're increasing that force, not of the impact, but of the rotational injury, and the severity is much greater. It's the same for all of the other tissue in our body. So we design these changes in place where you can change that surface and, and even the finish of the device, and you can shift the center of rotations, but you can also shift them in a detrimental detrimental way where you may get binding of the implant or heterotrophic ossification, or that stress is transferred to the end plate fixation where you could have lucencies of the end plates because the stress has to go somewhere. <clears throat> when we look at the elastomeric, it's different because for a lot of the de designs you're seeing that are coming out, some of which aren't in their IDE studies yet, you start to think about the material stiffness and the location of that implant, and you can alter again that range of motion. But some of the materials can be much stiffer than human tissue. And so what is that doing physiologically long term? And something's going to give, whether it's the bone or the tissue, or sometimes it's the implant and the materials. Alignment is crucial as we discussed. It can change the quality of motion um, in a negative manner. Uh, but also, if it binds, if an implant binds, you can have wear debris. You can have, even from the polymeric elastomeric um, side of things, you can have debonding of the elastic materials from the end plates. You can have polymeric breakdowns, failed sheaths that we would see. <coughs> Looking at the degrees of freedom, this is mainly my main point is, you know, we talk about this added compression and tension, but if the polymer is too stiff, or um, if the polymer is too stiff, I question how much compression and tension are you really getting? Is it enough? Polymers take a long time to loosen, basically, especially like polycarbonates, for instance. They'll imbibe the fluid, as will polyethylenes, but it takes a long time to really soften them. It's not a hydrogel. But then if we go too soft, we risk polymeric creep, crazing, fragmentation. So it's a balance trying to use these materials in the spine for long lengths of time and, and still think about, will these break down? We've seen polymers break down in vivo over time as well. And then, of course, we'd have the ball and socket with no translation with a fixed COR. Well, now we're forcing the spine to move about the implant COR. And yesterday we talked about we don't want to overtake the segment with an implant. We want the implant to basically shear and aid the tissue so the tissue can heal and respond appropriately and adapt. Finally, think about end plate fixation. Again, stress goes somewhere. If you have more stress, it's going to be transferred through the implant and then to the surrounding bone. So we try to develop, look at ways where we get larger surface of contact, Maybe we contour the end plates. We try to decrease the stress that those end plates will receive as well and dissipate it and ensure that it isn't transferred to the adjacent levels. Um, different elastic moduli, we talk about this, and, and I end it with more is not always better. We've got um, designs that have multiple components, Bryantis being one of them as an example. Sometimes Often, it's not a good thing because it's just more areas where things can go wrong. It's more areas where you have to make sure there is synergy with all those <coughs> components, um, <clears throat> which comes into the are we over-engineering. And we think about the different moduli and viscoelastic behavior of the human disc versus the elastomeric discs. Elastomeric discs are not viscoelastic. There are smart polymers out there that behave in a somewhat viscoelastic manner, but they're not approved for, for the bodies yet. I'm sure soon we'll see more come out.
Um, and we want to kind of minimize that constant or increased micro motion at the end plates to ensure that we've got good osseo integration, we've got um, uh, less motion, less stress, less strain being applied to those end plates because the weakest link will be the viscoelastic vertebral end plate that will fail and could result in loosening, dislodging, migration of the implant, as well as subsidence, i.e. pistoning through a weaker end plate. The surgical concerns, as you all know, we talk about misalignment, um, especially with single and, and double level TDRs, but being over aggressive in the procedures Improper sizing, you're only given so many sizes, but some of these degenerative discs are pretty tight, pretty small, uh, which brings you to, is that the right candidate? Do you wanna force an implant, a TDR, into someone who has severe degenerative discs or compromised heights and risk potentially distracting facets, strain, added strain on the ligaments? Um, and potentially dislodging migration, et cetera. So patient selection and patient compliance um, is always key here. That's just examples of dislodging. So I leave with form follows function. We talked yesterday with respect to, is it better to mimic anatomically the design of that device to look like our human tissue, to, to have composite disc uh, cores, basically, that may be elastomeric with two different materials, or is it more, better to mimic the function, the performance of it? And we think about those limitations. Um, the conventional materials that are currently used can we do better? Well, we're doing pretty well with the outcomes. Can we do better with the materials? Uh, apparently, it, where debris is an issue with all implants, even fusion implants. But once you're fused, you've minimized that motion at that level. So now you're not getting the debris. And again, we talked yesterday that debris is detrimental. When it's assessed from the benchtop from our area, we're looking at you know, millions of cycles um, of loading in multiple planes, and then we analyze that particulate, and we analyze the device-related particulate. Some of the early studies just kind of took all of the particulate, and they're a bit inflated with wear. But we're not analyzing all the different motions. We don't run it under, well, we do run it under coupled motions, but there's so many other factors that play into this where we could minimize that risk. And there's some new technology coming out that does minimize wear risk. But again, if you're misaligned and your implant binds, guess what? You're going to have more wear. If you have a polyethylene core that wears over time, now you're changing that angular curvature over time because it is wearing. We see that in knees. We see that in hips. You know, that's why they go in and they'll replace the, the polyethylene cups. But here, if we change that, they're small implants. We're not going back in to take out the core and put in a brand new core to regain that angulation. So what happens as it wears down over time and you start to change that fixation, that angulation that you had originally for that patient? So there's pros and cons to all existing TDRs. And it comes down to how do we decide what design and if there's a design that better suits that patient. And are we over-engineering? Where do we need to go and how close are we with not only the biomimetics part of this, but getting it right? And, and that's a question we throw out for many, many different implants, new technologies. Thank you. Lisa, really good. I'm going to ask all of our fellows to watch this annually now um, as mandatory screening. This is really meaningful biomechanics. Thank you for making it so clear. Could you go back to the differential slide about the biomechanical features of different discs? You rightly said in the beginning that all of our patients uh, know there was a great comparison of all the, I think, six disc arthroplasties. I forgot the slide number. Yeah, this one. Great. This one. Perfect. So, as you're rightly stating, all of our patients are different. Now, there's a great study by Brennan Buckland et al. I forgot who the primary author was, um, that measured distinctly every single cervical disc level 
and quantified it. And my take home message was not just as every patient different, but every disc level is highly different. C23 is highly different from C56, C67. <clears throat> are there different discs which are more suitable than others for certain disc levels? Should we be more level specific, i.e. 5, 6, 6, 7, the action discs? Should we select a disc that is more constrained rather than something where at another level, if it's clinically indicated, we can have a more playful disc, if I may say so, a non-biomechanic term, but I'll coin that. You know, that is an excellent question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wondering about that. And, and I too am guilty of over-engineering because I would say, of course, you know, even the angulation at 6-7 can differ. So I had a cervical spine fusion years ago, and um, my spine lacks lordosis. And I planned the surgery with the surgeon, and I said, look, you know, you don't need to go in and make my neck look like it's 25 years old, because it's not. You know, I know I'm only 30, but, <laughs> but um, you know, go in. And I had a paralysis. I'd lost my triceps. Um, and so they had to go in. And it was, and don't try to jack up. I have a four, five, five, six, and six, seven, and my fusion was at four, five. But don't try to jack up my height, because guess what? It, it, it's not there on all of the levels. And I lost the lordotic. Now, I did, wasn't having issues so much with the loss of curvature, but you know, you see these patients where they'll go in and they'll go, all right, we're gonna get that curve back. And there are times when you have to, depending on the extent, but then there are times where you don't because you do have to think about the patient, but you also have to think of the levels. There are differences in our spinal levels, not only with the discs, um, and the curvatures, but also between levels. We know that in the lumbar spine, they've had studies where you actually have different bone densities per vertebral body. So, you know, why wouldn't that apply to the rest of our body? And so how patient specific do we get? That's the other part. And, and that's why I go back to, are we over-engineering? Do we need to over-engineer? Do we make patient specific? I mean, a lot of it's not feasible. This is mainly theoretical. But where do we go next? You know, the best would be, let's find a disc regeneration. It would be fantastic. But if you're doing that, you better do it for wrinkles and everything else. That's all I'm going to say. So. I do. I do. Thank you so much. It was just absolutely enlightening talk. I feel like I come to most of these meetings uh, uh, wanting to symbolically drink from the fountain knowledge, but uh, you've made that impossible. I feel like this was more like a fire hose. I took <laughs> pictures of almost every one of your slides because today when I'm traveling, I'm going to look at them and probably study each one for a long, long time. Thank you again. And uh, in, in my practice, I have adopted multiple discs, and I'm, I feel like I'm knocking on the door of trying to figure out, is there a certain disc that's better for certain patient and certain pathologies, because just like Ian said, it's not just the, each patient, it's the, each disc and each pathology. And hopefully over a period of time, as we kind of uh, put together a number of different centers and gather our data together and pull them together, we may be able to tease out, are there certain indications, certain patients, certain bone density, certain disc pathologies, that uh, a, a one disc may provide a better outcome versus the other. But again, absolutely enlightening talk. And I think what you said, as far as fellows watching this, I think I'm going to watch it every year. <laughs> great, great comment, uh, Armin, because my thought process in looking at patients is, doesn't make a difference. Any disc will work on this patient, or is this, this need to be a more specific design? A quick question for Lisa. Uh, for, oh, first of all, your, your introduction about um, the perfect form and function of the spine will, would play great in the South with all my uh, Texan intelli what they call intelligent design people. Uh, but at any rate, um, your definition of unconstrained, and like Armin, I learned a ton. Um, does that apply to anything other than a nucleus replacement? Because you said unconstrained, it just there nothing hits anything. Anything with two end plates, eventually the end plates will collide. So they're so all the mechanical discs, I don't think we can say they're unconstrained. I don't either. Okay. I, I have to be honest. Then I, I was don't. listening correctly. It, theoretically, no, that's the definition I have found mm -hmm. online. That's the definition for unconstrained. But I think but, we need to add one more term to this, right? Yeah. We, we've been stuck with constraint, which is like how much constraint do you have to motion? Like, is there some sort of block, like you said? Or how much restraint there is to motion? 
Mm -hmm. Does it make, do you know what I'm saying? So if you look at something like M6, I think it does have not just some constraint that's built into it, but also restraint to motion, how much force you have to apply to move it, right? So I think this, so I think our terminology in a way needs to expand to better describe more than just one pattern. Yeah, we started talking about this when we were just talking about Charité and ProDisc lumbar, and we just threw those terms out there without definitions from, you know, our smart engineers. We just did them as clinicians, and they've stuck, unfortunately, and they're not very descriptive. I yeah. agree with you. Yeah, and, and it differs for so many different implants. We're putting, putting these implants in three categories, and that's it. It's like, if you were to ask me about elastomeric, just because they have an additional six, uh, degree of freedom and compression <coughs> tension, that's not unconstrained. Huh. It's constrained, it's constrained by design, by material. Um, and our body isn't totally unconstrained either, you know? And, and that's where- Thank goodness. Thank goodness is right, you know? I, I, I think our, in all honesty, our industry, our biggest weakness is you've got folks like me, the design engineers um, outside of, you know, the corporate engineers, the, um, Weird anomalies, right? I, I spend my life in the preclinical, but to be able to, unfortunately, I have a lot of colleagues that I know and I can learn from that clinical aspect. What are you seeing? You know, and really trying to understand that because we've got the clinical data, but I've seen those studies and I go, all right, but here's a variable, here's a variable. And the nice clean IDE studies are pristine because they're, you're forced to run it to minimize those variables. It's a good way to do the study to gather that data. It's not just one study, it's about gathering all of that data. That's why that meta-analysis work is spectacular. And, but we're sitting here looking at it on a machine, looking at it in animals going, all right, here's all the weaknesses. And again, I go back to, you have to put the entire puzzle together and put that story together because it's always gonna be, if this, then this. And having the, the engineers understand, here's what happens in the OR, because it's about the system. It's even about the tooling that you're going to put in. If it's difficult to put in, guess what? You're gonna have more errors, no one's gonna use it, you won't sell it, make it slick, make it easy for the surgeons, and think about the environment too, and then the long term for the patient as well. And, and we need more of that where Honestly, the engineers who go, yeah, I'm going to put this into a space this big, are sitting with the surgeons and the clinical group going, all right, this, is, this makes sense. You're seeing, does it really matter? Thank you, Lisa. Lisa, we could, we could go on a long ways here, but we, we've got to move on to, before Dr. Lieberman falls out. Thank you.